Hello, everyone. <clears throat> so, yes, I do have a head cold. If you don't want to hear me with a head cold, you might not want to listen. Um, but I can't stop looking into the Bembenic case and the coincidences between Avery and Bembenic. We've got the same individuals. The more I'm in the Lori Bembenic blog spot site and read, the more I feel like you guys need to be with me because I like to research with you. So some of it I haven't read, we'll be reading together. Um, and we're just gonna go with the flow. Um, basically, it's a day off for me from work till three. So I'm gonna have to get off here probably by no later than noon. Um, so this will probably be about an hour and a half. And in that, I want um, as much input from you guys as possible because I like to share that. Some disclaimers. Um, we do have coughing individuals in the background. Like I said, Influenza B is going through Wisconsin. <laughs> and we were the lucky individuals in this household. Everybody got it. So at least we're all sick at once. And um, it's not that bad. We've got cold medicine. We sound worse than we feel in some cases. So just know that. And so I, I just can't shake how like what we went over last night let's do like a little review a summary if you will so we discovered that michael camp who is the head like of the head supervisor of the milwaukee crime lab is is literally the one that does an internal audit on the madison crime lab when the avery evidence is being tested now keep in mind he he did cite that there were um, a, there was a critical issue and that was that the CODIS the FBI CODIS stations that you can put in DNA profile and it'll kick out the identity if the identity is uploaded into the data bank well he did cite that those were not being guarded that there was 13 or 14 stations that anybody could go upload into that data bank. And we had visitors all the time. We had Kratz down there, Fassbender down there, Wiegert down there. Every time you hear in the CASA report that these individuals are delivering something to the crime lab, okay, do they have the opportunity to have entered a match in something? Would they know how? I don't know, but it was such a critical hit um, that even an internal audit produced um, that this had to be changed. And the FBI did require um, a change in that service. So that was interesting. That's Michael Camp. Now, also, Michael Camp comes into the Avery case with um, when Sherry coughs on the bullet on the sample over here, the standard, right? She has to have uh, the deviation from the protocol because it's breaking all the rules in the lab. Now, at this point, if the standard has been compromised, what that means to you guys and me is that the environment is not sanitary for this DNA procedure. And therefore, if the standard, which is the whole point of having the standard sample, has been, for lack of better words, violated then or contaminated, then so should the the object that we're testing for DNA, which life is being weighed on. And she deviates from protocol to say that, you know, we're going to ignore the environment being contaminated and we're just going to let this piece of evidence fly. And not only is that the problem, she uses all of it up when there's ample ample testing that could have been done from that bullet. Also, the defense is not allowed to watch this event because at the time when the testing is supposed to be going on, the defense in the Avery case, Butin and Strain, are told that there would be risk to the environment with the presence of the defense and it could risk the only piece of serious hard evidence that ties them to Avery. So, no, they couldn't come in. Oh, there's a truth train. And so the defense doesn't even get to watch the testing of the bullet because they're they're considered a risk for contamination of the evidence, yet Sherry Colhane can 
can spit, cough on this bullet. Why is she not wearing a face mask? I mean, how do you spit on a bullet if you're wearing a face mask? You know, which is standard operating procedures in all of this DNA testing. Because her spit is what ruined this sample. It's that imperative. So they can't, they can't say, well, we took extreme me measures to protect this bullet because obviously if she spit on the bullet, she's not wearing a mask. But they're so concerned about contamination, they keep the defense out from testing the bullet. How does that work? And then you look at the situation of not only did she use it all up, but then in other samples like A23 on the back of the cargo of the blue wrap, we have a bloody handprint, which has blood in it, the richest source of DNA besides spit. And she can only test it once and get a partial. So who is the one that allowed all this to happen? Who signed the deviation report for Sherry Culhane to allow her to break the rules and not be concerned about the environment after they had made such a squabble about the environment, not letting the defense end? So who signed those papers? Well, it happened to be not anybody from the Madison Crime Lab, which it should have been her direct supervisor, but rather it came from the Milwaukee Crime Lab. Yeah. And who signed up? Who signed up and said, yeah, that's okay. Go ahead with that. You got it. Michael Camp's little group there. One of his assistants is the one that went and signed Sherry Colhan's paper. No reviews about it. Nothing. Just interchangeable. That's a big deal when you look at the Bimbanic case. Because we have Michael Camp saying that all the records of the Bimbenic case have been destroyed in a flood and that they put a piece of paper in place of the file saying nothing's available. When it turns out later after trial that that file did not have any water damage at all. Now they use that same flood that allegedly destroyed the files in the Bimbenic case to say it basically destroyed the, the bullet fragment. In the Bimbenic case, we have a bullet fragment. Mm -hmm. That bullet is, is the piece that would show which gun this bullet was fired from. So what they do is they take a gun that suspect, they're like, would the bullet have come from this? They fire a bullet through the gun. They compare the bullet that come out of the gun during the testing to the bullet that they found at the scene. And if the markings are identical, they can say, well, this bullet at the scene came from this gun. Well, those markings, that identifier that would have connected the murder weapon to Schultz's off-duty revolver, those bullets go missing. Poof, gone. Hey, Kelly, how are you? Welcome to the chat. Um, so with that, we're into part two pretty good now of the Ben Bennett case. It ended in my live last night, horrific. Like my computer completely froze. It was just horrible. I don't even know how it ended. I didn't watch the end. I just was like, oh, well, life is life. And I'm, I'm just like you. I'm a researcher and I like, you know, started this off with my phone doing my journal and it was just basically to work with others and trying to get to the, to the heart of the matter. Well, now that we've stumbled in the Bambanic case, there are so many pieces of that case that are duplicated, um, for lack of better words, over in the Avery case. And do we have the same individuals? Yeah. Because it was Mark Williams that was the one that supposedly, allegedly, has told the state crime lab to put that letter that the, this file, the Bambenic file, was destroyed in the flood. He's the one that said, hey, here's the orders. Put that in there. Right? Mark Williams, lawyer, state. Okay. Well, then think about DCI, state, Fassbender. 
telling the state crime lab, Sherry Colhane, hey, put her in the trailer, put her in the garage, try to put her in the trailer, try to put her in the garage, right? Again, you have orders coming from state that are improper. And again, I'm going to say it for the hundredth time. <clears throat> If I tell you to try to do something, then that would mean you have the control of results and that I'm wanting you to apply your ability to my request. And what do we have? Sherry Colhane. Hey, Lisa, how are you? Hey, John Boats. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me why we find all the evidence later if this isn't a plant job. It's the only option left. We've eliminated everything else. Uh, we get to the point to where they're, they're, they paint two complete different stories. So DCI try to sell the story that Stephen went down to Deer Camp on Cuss Road, drove up through the backside of Rodant's property. That gets suppressed. The story gets changed because King Kratz comes in the picture and he needs to enforce the Denny Law. And in order to do that, it has to be much more personable to just Stephen. And that's where we have Fassbender, put her in the garage, put her in the trailer, try. Try to put her there. Lisa says, let's get dangerous. <laughs> All right, let's get dangerous. Let's jump into it. We've got 16 on board. I'm jumping over. This is a Lori Bambinick blogspot.com. We're going to be grabbing different parts. This is, um, I'm going to read because it says so much why we're doing the Bambinick case and the Avery case together. This dedication, I read it yesterday. It's worth hearing a few times because we from the Stephen Avery team could have read, wrote something like this. Lori Bembenek Info. This blog is dedicated to Lori Bembenek, who passed away on November 20, 2010. In her name, evidence of the corruption that permeates the Wisconsin criminal justice system and caused her false confession, I'm sorry, correction, her false conviction, there was never a confession, I just read it wrong, and imprisonment will be exposed. It is hoped that the injustices she suffered will never again be endured by anyone else in the state of Wisconsin. This blog is also dedicated to attorney Mary L. Rohr, who has worked tirelessly in Lori's behalf for over two decades. In her name, evidence of the corruption that permeates the Wisconsin criminal justicism and caused her false conviction and imprisonment will be exposed. That's what we're doing. We're going to try to jump on board with exposing the Bembenic corruption and that it's the same individuals that are handling the Avery case. This, we're now wide awake. America, listen. Stephen Avery's innocent. Brendan Dassey's innocent. Lori Bembenek was innocent. They are framed by the same individuals who are corrupt, wearing badges, wearing official titles. And we are starting to see that this goes all the way up to state level. So we need to get the news on board. Media needs to get on board. We need the marshal on board. We need to have help. We need above YouTube. We need above websites. We've all, I mean, we can sign all the petitions in the world. We need the media. I'm calling out to Fox News, get on board, figure out why there's connections between the same names in the Bembenic case to the Avery case. Because this is ridiculous. Remember what Ira Robbins said? The media refused to touch the Bembenic case and, and seemed to side with the DA. We'll stop with the false news. Somebody get some balls and be an investigative journalist. Get the story together and get it spread like wildfire all over Wisconsin news. Because this needs to be done. Locals are just stewing right now with what they're going to do. They are going to make a wave. They are upset. They are seeing this time and time again in Wisconsin. I mean, how many times do I have supporters and listeners make the comment, we all know this is corrupt, 
but nothing gets done. Why does it not get done? All right, we're going to start off. We're going to go top side a minute, and then we're going to come back and read that. So, hey, we just got dangerous, right? Hey, Chris Arnold, how are you? Um, we're going to start with the Bembenic info again. We're on the blogspot.com. Um, we're going to do part six, which it, everything's out of order because I just don't, I don't know. I just flow with the flow and I want you guys to research this with me. So I started to read this and when I did, I'm like, no, we need to go live and do this together. So part six on the trail of the motive. On June 2nd, 1981, just four days after the Christine Schultz murder, her girlfriend, Dorothy Polka, gave a statement to unknown police officers who had written a report but suspiciously failed to identify themselves on that document. See Exhibit 6-1. The report describes that Christine was, quote, afraid of her husband, Milwaukee detective Alfred Schultz due to the fact that Alfred Schultz would, at times, display a violent temper. Also, quote, Ms. Polka personally observed Alfred Schultz slap Christine across the face. The report continued, quote, that Alfred Schultz was bothering her on occasion, and Christine Schultz told her that she was frightened of her estranged husband, Alfred. <clears throat> Let me grab a drink so we get a little smoother read here. Okay. The same police report also states in part, photograph which for some reason or another Christine Schultz considered risque and which the victim refused to show her at that time. And that, quote, she only mentioned this incident about the photograph due to the fact that if one of those photos was in some way embarrassing to Christine, then she felt our department should be aware of this in case there might be a connection between the photographs, the photographer, and the death of the victim. Since Christine was afraid of Alfred Schultz, private investigator Ira Robbins has long believed it only reasonable that Schultz should have been considered a prime suspect in her murder. The fact that there were nude photographs of him and that it was widely known that there was an internal investigation about his criminal conduct raises a level of suspicion. Internal Affairs reports received by Robbins clearly showed that Lori Bambenek had obtained photographs of the nude parties and had initiated the investigation into the police misconduct. Those reports also provided evidence that the district attorney E. Michael McCain, or McCann, I think it's McCann, refused to issue any criminal charges requested by Internal Affairs against Schultz. Instead, he never disclosed that very important defense evidence and assisted Schultz in gaining complete immunity from prosecution. Schultz then testified as a credible witness that Bembenek was the only one with access to his off-duty gun. So we're going to, again, just read the highlighted area, um, but this site is listed down below in the description once this live is done. You can click this. You can go to this part, which is part six, Tra on the trail of the motive and you can read this in full disclosure and I want you guys on the site if possible this is so unbelievable with what she's been through the corruption the suppression of the evidence that possibly the police are absolutely tampering evidence and falsifying evidence and then we look at the Avery case and it, it's the same people please okay so this is what it says she, so we need to back up and see where they're talking about. We're going to read this this part. Relative to her acquaintance with Christine Schultz, Ms. Pocus stated the following. She stated that she has known Christine Schultz for approximately 11 years, having first met her when the victim's husband, Efford Schultz, and Ms. Polka's husband began playing baseball together. She states that their husbands played ball together for a number of years, the last time being in a softball league playing for the Bell Nell Corporation. Dorothy Polka states that through the years, she and Christine Schultz became close and ultimately bowled together in various daytime bowling leagues around the Milwaukee area. Ms. Polka stated that during the past several years, she, Christine Schultz, and their respective husbands had occasions to double date numerous times and that they frequently 
or frequently socialized together at one another's residence. She further states that she became aware of possible material troubling between or marital trouble between Mr. and Mrs. Schultz approximately four years ago, when Christine Schultz told her, Miss Polka, that she suspected or knew that Alfred Schultz was seeing other women. She further stated that Christine Schultz at time had mentioned that she was afraid of her husband, Alfred Schultz, due to the fact that Alfred Schultz would at time display violet temper. Dorothy Polka further stated that on at least one occasion approximately two years ago, while she, her husband, and the Schultz were double dating, Alfred Schultz got angry with Aunt Christine Schultz while they were riding in an automobile. Miss Schultz personally um, observed Alfred Schultz slap Christine across the face. She stated at the time Christine ran from the vehicle in which they had traveled and that after a period of talking, she finally re-entered the car, at which time all of them returned to their home. Miss Polka went to this on to the state on to state that Christine Schultz had mentioned at various times following the breakup of the Schultz marriage that Alfred Schultz was bothering her on occasion and Christine Schultz told her that she was frightened of her estranged husband Alfred. We jump down um I'm not sure which page this is, but we'll go on to read the highlighted area. Dorothy Sue Polka further mentioned that in about April 1981 while she was the residence of the oh while she was I think they mean at the residence of the victim Christine Schultz the victim showed her a series of photographs photos depicting various head of shoulder poses she stated that at this time the victim informed her that the photos were taken out at the request of Christine Schultz by a photographer who either does work for or uses equipment at the Proline manufacturer in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Dorothy Polka stated that Christine Schultz made mention at the time of one particular photograph. For some reason or another, Christine Schultz considered risque, in which the victim refused to show her at the time. She stated that always knew Christine to be a quiet, modest type person and that she felt at the time that Christine was embarrassed for some reason relative to the particular photo, although Miss Polka never did see that photo. She stated that she only mentioned this incident about the photograph due to the fact that if one of these photos was in some way embarrassing to Christine, then she felt our department should be aware of this in case there was a connection between this photograph, the photographer, and the death of the victim. Hmm. I wonder what that photo was. Okay, we're back again with photos. It's all about photos. Let's go topside, then we're going to come back and grab some more information. <laughs> Gizmo Doug. Hey, John Boats. Um, what do you guys think of this situation? I mean, we have a lot of information that the evidence is disappearing in the Ben Bennett case or claimed to have disappeared. And then we also have that in the Avery case. And you've got Mark Williams very involved today with the Avery case. He's but dialing Zellner. So he's a lawyer for the state. He's talking right, thinks he's talking to his whole his whole boss. I mean, honestly, this this poor woman, Ben Benick, my God. And how did she get tied into the photos? Right? So she, I'm trying to sort this out. So she turns in photos to get an investigation going, correct? Because she's been accused of smoking marijuana and she's saying, well, the other cops are doing worse. Why are you targeting me? Meanwhile, that investigation goes underway. All of a sudden, Fred Schultz starts seeing Lori. She starts dating a cop while this investigation is going on. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just trying to sum this up. Um, this Alfred Schultz has an ex-wife, Christine Schultz, who's now telling this Miss Polka about a particular photo she doesn't want to share, she seems embarrassed about. And then that woman ends up dead. 
So now Lori is dating this cop and his ex-wife ends up dead over a photograph and she happens to have turned in a whole bunch of photographs. So now it turns out that they try to establish that Alfred Schultz or, uh, yeah, Alfred Schultz would be at work, right? They try to give him an alibi that he's at work, and that's why it's his off-duty revolver that only Lori's at home with. And that's how come she did it, right? Well, let's go look and see what his alibi was really like, all right? Um, let's see, more credibility issues. Is that the one we need to click? Click, click, click. Yes. Okay, so this was posted November 28th, 2010 on a Sunday. Part 3, More Credibility Issues On the morning of the Christine Schultz murder, Milwaukee police detectives Alfred O. Schultz and his partner, Michael Durfee, wrote official reports about their shift activities. Those reports stated that they had been on patrol, stopped to eat, investigated a burglary complaint, and were at the police department when they heard officers being dispatched to the homicide call. So stop there. That means that that is what the jury heard, okay? Now, let's continue. Several days later, both detectives were required to write more detailed reports about their activities. The new reports contained additional details, but omitted their true activities. Since both detectives had investigated the alleged murder weapon and its connection to Ben Benick and testified in her jury trial, their credibility would have been an important issue. But their true activities were concealed until it was too late. During Schultz's trial testimony, he finally disclosed that he and Durfee had been to Georgie's Pub about detective business. See Exhibit 3-1. That information destroyed the credibility of both detectives and the truthfulness of their reports concerning their night's activities, but the jury never learned about the conflict between their report and actual activities. On October 29, 1990, Ben Benick's private investigator, Ira Robbins, obtained a sworn affidavit of George Marco Polis, see Exhibit 3.2. That affidavit describes previously undisclosed information about Detective Schultz and Durfee's true activities on the night and the murder of, I read that wrong, on the night of the murder and Schultz's connection to Frederick Horenberger. Hornberger had served time for a prior manslaughter and has long been su suspected of being involved in Christine, Christine's murder. Eight people are on record as claiming that Hornberger had confessed to them that he murdered Christine Schultz. We're going to stop there for just a minute. I'm going to grab a drink. We're going to talk about that. So let's go topside. John Boat says, I've seen apples with less worms. I know, right? Okay. So here's the deal. During the trial, we have two witnesses, eyewitnesses, that may actually be, they're the, they're the star witnesses, if you will, for the, for the prosecution, may actually be the suspects. Right? What do we have in the Avery case? The two star witnesses, Scott Tadich and Bobby Dassey, may very well have been the actual main primary suspects. Same exact thing. How does this continue to happen? I know history repeats itself, but my God, we have to start sharing this information. If you're aware of the pattern, it is insanity to continue to let it repeat and expect something to change, a different result. We know that. So what do we have to change? We have got to figure that out as a group. That's what we need to figure out. So let's go back over. We're going to get right back into this. So this is about what we're talking about right now, for those of you that just joined, is we're on part two of the Bimbenic, um coincidences 
that are connected to the Avery case. And we just discussed how the two primary witnesses in Ben Bennett case for um, all kinds of the information could have been actually the two main suspects. So they turned star witness. We have that in the Avery case with Scott Tadich and Bobby Dassey very primary suspects in today's standards under the defense, but back at the time during the actual trial, both of those individuals were star witnesses against the suspect. Well, of course they would. I mean, what is the motive? If they're primary suspect, it's to save their arse, of course. So in that, in that mode of thinking, let's read the highlighted parts. Again, you can come to the site, lauriebenbenickblogspot.com, and you, you need to dig in and read the whole thing in context because I'm just taking their own highlighted area. So this is on the alibi of the ex-husband that now is very suspect to have possibly either facilitated the murder of his ex-wife alleged, allegedly or done it himself. So here we go. Question. And then you and Durfee drove over to Georgie's pub and you went about your detective business. Answer, yes. Question, I don't mean you went over to drink, but you went over there about detective business. Answer, yes. And then somebody's written the word, what? So right there it blows that they're not, it blows the alibi because it changes their location in regards to what could have happened. Um, so... Let's come down here. We're going to read some of the comments that were posted back in 2010. Anonymous says, oh my God. So there is proof that Schultz had a connection with the very man who had told eight people that he is the one who murdered Christine and no one questioned this or was allowed what or was allowed as evidence. No wonder Lori escaped prison, right or wrong. She knew she was fighting for her life and was being set up and no one was listening. And in fact, she was being set up by the people in high authority that she couldn't fight alone. Why wasn't this all posted way before she died? Randy says, my mom has always said that Freddie killed Christina or Christine. She said she even tried to contact MPD back when this happened, but nobody would listen. Anonymous says, I've got to say, just by reading these few short pages, red flags are popping up all over the place. I've never thought Miss Bembenek to be guilty or have always believed Schultz hired someone to do it in Framer. This is horrible, and I hope to I hope that someday her name is cleared. Anonymous wants to know where is Durfee now and also stated, I think he teaches at Milwaukee University. Holy crap, you guys. He is also a paranoid who believes the government is up to no good with census information, so will not fill out any more of the number of occupants. Interesting. Well, it's kind of interesting that, you know, we also had Couchet and the Avery case who absolutely refused to trust DNA testing because, like he said, it could be fabricated or tampered. And he kept going on and on about where'd the hair come from, where'd the hair come from quite interesting so even even the alibis aren't checking out with these two individuals and we have that with Scott Tadich and Bobby Dassey their alibis don't check out at all um, and so again coincidence after coincidence let's see here John Boat says they kind of follow a template when they frame somebody and if we learn that pattern you guys we can be aware of it and I believe anytime you ID a problem a symptom you're more likely to get to the cure. If you just allow yourself to keep being surprised by the same result, or you don't get informed about the past history and see a pattern, you are susceptible to falling victim and being trapped within that again. So if this is an apple and there's so many wormholes in this case, they seem too numerous to connect and understand. However, we get the same individuals, evidence disappearing, right? Framing an individual, using suspects, the primary suspects, as the actual key witnesses, star witnesses in the crime. You start connecting the bigger picture and the wormholes all start connecting and you just have a rotten apple to the core. Just saying. 
So let's go ahead and let's check out a couple more things. Um, the state will do anything to win. Uh, what bullet was really tested? Which gun was it? What one do you guys want to read? Which gun was it? What bullet was really tested? The state will do anything to win. What do you guys want to... You guys, somebody hit me up. Tell me what we should read because I'm like all of them, but we don't have time for all of them because it's already 11 o'clock. So I think one more is about all we can fit in today. And then come Monday, I'll try to do a part three and we'll try to dig into the ones we haven't covered. So does anybody have any suggestions on which part? Again, which gun was it? Which is part 14. Part 15, what bullet was really tested? Or part 16, the state will do anything to win. Um, while we're waiting on that reply, you look at this situation with Scott and, and um, Bobby, right? Scott is, is reported by Zellner as not going to see his mother that day at all in Green Bay. Yet he's completely missing from work. So why would he be missing from work if he wasn't seeing his mother on the exact day this girl goes missing from that property? Why do we get a report that there was an eyewitness, which was Stephen, that saw Scott Tadich's truck on the Dassey property just around noon? Why does Zellner say that Bobby pings where Scott should and Scott pings where Bobby should? And that, you know, that leads me to believe they've changed positions. Is it possible that Bobby actually took off in Scott Tadich's truck and left Scott Tadich behind? Is that Scott Tadich watching from the window and seeing Teresa? Was it possible there was another uh, hustle shot down on Cuss Road that he had made some call earlier that day? from the Dassey landline, the 8715. Is that why we get that recording, you know, um, on the Dassey machine that they claim and say that, you know, she says something, I, you're going to have to call me. I don't have your address. I, I don't have any information and I'm going to try to make it there by this time and blah, blah, blah. Sounds like another hustle shot because why would she have not just called back her own secretary receptionist lady or Angela Schuster or Don whatever Pulaski and said, hey, what was that address again? But she doesn't have it. So it's not Stephen's address. It's not the Dassey address. It's an address that this victim does not have and she needs a phone call back to be given that address. Where was that? Was it Cuss Road? All right. John's made a vote. He says bullet. So we're going to go back over. And we're going to choose part 15. What bullet was really tested? Now keep in mind, we have the bullet in the Avery case, right? That bullet gets completely used up by Colhane and nobody can ever test it again. Bull. Zellner's smart enough that she got her crew to test that bullet. And when it went under the high power magnifying glass, you know, the microscope, and it's magnified, this is wood, not bone. The DNA is not blood, and the DNA is not bone. So, really? Okay, this was posted Monday, January 17th, 2011. Part 15, what bullet was really tested? I'm going to grab a drink. I'm such a loud drinker, right? But I love tea. Okay. On December 21st, 1981, two Milwaukee detectives acting pursuant to court order traveled to Minneapolis, Minnesota and allegedly delivered the bullet removed from Christine Schultz's body along with Elfert's off-duty gun for ballistic retesting by Bimedix Experts Exhibit 15-1. Those experts reported a match between the two items they had tested, but what they did 
but what did they actually test? And were they tricked into providing false opinions? In December 2002, ballistic experts Herbert Leon McDonnell and Stanton O. Berg wrote in emails that the bullet they had examined in 1981 and matched to Schultz's off-duty gun had the markings in ML 61881, Exhibit 15-2. Those are the only markings they described. Since it is accepted practice for ballistic experts to completely describe all markings on each and every item they inspect, test, or retest, they either overlooked or failed to document very important markings on the bullet actually removed from Christine. During the autopsy, Dr. Elaine A. Samuels, now let's stop there a minute, this is the Associated Medical Examiner, okay, for Milwaukee County. Remember, she's the whistleblower. We just did that part in part one last night, okay? So at first, she testifies, she gives a truthful statement, but later, they produce an envelope during the trial that she has sealed, and when they open it, blonde hairs come out, but it, it's blonde or red hairs or whatever. But she claims there were never any put in there. So she whistleblows. She loses her career. Everything goes to hell. She's a whistleblower. Hats off to her again. So let's go back and read what she does. During the autopsy, Dr. Elaine A. Samuels, Associated Medical Examiner for Milwaukee County, removed the bullet from Christine and wrote two sets of initials on the base. She placed the initials CJS for Christine J. Schultz and EAS for herself, Exhibit 15-3. But suspiciously, experts Berg and McDonnell did not have that information in the notes. In 2005, during the deposition testimony of Wisconsin Crime Laboratory personnel, startling new evidence was revealed. Okay, hold on. Deposition, right? Testimony of the Wisconsin Crime Laboratory personnel. Depositions, again, 2005. So they've got two depositions going on in 2005. The Steve Avery depositions that we know from Manitowoc County, as well as the Bembetic case. What? If Stephen Avery's case and this Bembetic information would have both surfaced at the same time, what an explosion that would have been. It may have turned $36 million into God knows what. Is that why states jumped in? Wow, that's a revelation for me. That really says a lot that this is too, I'm going to read it again. In 2005, during the deposition testimony of Wisconsin Crime Laboratory personnel, startling new information was revealed. State records do not have the bullet removed from Schultz's body ever leaving the crime lab in December 1981. But what bullet was actually taken to Minnesota, tested and compared to, by the two experts. That's anyone's guess. Check it out. That bullet is never documented in the chain of custody from leaving the crime lab since December in 1981. Guess what? We have broken chain of command in the Avery case too. So let's go ahead and look at Exhibit 15-1. We're going to hit the highlights again. Read this all in its context, please. Um, it just will make more sense. But for, for this, since we're short on time, we're going to read the highlighted. It says, pursuant to the order of Judge, oh boy, Sirkowitzki. Lord, that's very close to the same name, but it's not the same judge as we have. But anyway, we appear with the weapon, a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver, model 37, serial number something 697539 on Milwaukee, Police Department Inventory, number 817541. We took the lead slug removed from the body of the victim on MPD Inventory 807259 from the Regional Crime Laboratory and three tested bullets and cases. They are on Crime Lab number 1981-1574 listed as items BE1, BE2, and BE3. So they're stating that they, I mean, right in the court papers, they're stating through this affidavit and report 
that they took this right out of the crime lab. However, we have this Herbert, Herbert Leon McDonald. It's an email. It's dated uh, Monday, December 09, 2002. Subject Bambi. I looked at my notes on this case in response to your call of last night. My notes on the evidence bullet consist of the following. In ML 618, 81 contained in the plastic envelope inside a box marked envelope 807259 item number one Christine Jean Schultz number 1056 81 52081 R 811574 bullet marked in 197.5 grains missile from left beast Stan Staten Oberg then he goes on to say and this is December 10th, 2002, which is a day later. I interpret my notes to mean that the first markings in quotes came from the bullet itself, but I cannot be sure of that. In other words, the NM61881. Wow. So no chain of custody, custody shows that they took the bullet from the crime lab to even be lost in this flood because there's no chain of custody documenting that this bullet ever left the crime lab. So what bullets? I mean, we can go all day here, but how did they even know? I mean, they were given a bullet, but like he said, what bullet was really tested? Um, let's go back up to top side. All right, you guys, I appreciate you joining me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call this live down. We'll come back with part three probably on Monday. I just want to keep going in this Bembetta case because look at the similarities in this Avery case. It's all about the bullet. It's all about photography. Um, it's all about tampering evidence. And if these individuals, I mean, once you're caught with your pants down, we're not going to trust you again. And in the Ben Bennett case, you guys are caught with your pants down. And it's the same individuals. So now, there's no way I give a crap about what the state crime lab said about this deviation or anything. I don't believe that's the blood and the rav of the victim. I refuse to believe it now because they got caught with their pants down falsifying evidence to frame a woman into being convicted as a murderer. It's like they make a murder in the other case. The cop may, allegedly, may have been the person to kill this ex-wife, right? Isn't it interesting that we have Ryan being referred to as um, unofficial law enforcement? He's one producing all the DNA evidence in this case, left and right, living in the victim's home. And look at the Ben Bennett case. The ex-husband, holy crap, becomes a primary witness to frame the suspect. What do we have Ryan doing? Becoming a primary witness, leading the search team. Well, what was the Schultz guy doing? Alfred Schultz, he's in there examining his off-duty revolver, acting like he's an authority, and he couldn't have touched his off-duty revolver. What? Why are you in a bar? And don't give me this crap about detective business. It, if you had to lie about it, you aren't supposed to be there, or it puts somehow it puts you in, in uh, more in, in a suspect's light. Or you wouldn't have lied about your alibi. The only reason to lie about an alibi is if it's going to incriminate you if you don't. Let's make that clear. For all the people in both cases where their alibis aren't holding water, what were you doing that implicated you so much so that you had to make up a story to cover it up, right? All right, guys, let's end on that thought. I want to thank you all. And uh, for those of you that didn't jump on the live last night, uh, I want to say happy Valentine's Day. Happy late <laughs> Valentine's Day.
destruido. Hey Jerome, I'm making a murder. Bon Bonjour et tous. I don't know if I said that right. <laughs> It's the French crew. They're coming at the very end. Sorry, sorry. We're just about ready to wrap it up. I have to get ready for work and all that kind of stuff. But please rewatch this. We're working on um, the coincidences between the Ben Bennett case and um, the Avery case. And we are learning the, the bigger picture is basically in the Ben Bennett case. The thing we found out today is that they took the two primary suspects and turned them into... Uh, big star eyewitnesses to frame Lori Bembenek. And we have the same thing in the Avery case. They took Scott um, Tadich and Bobby Dassey, right? And they, they, those are the two primary suspects, or should have been, as well as Ryan Hilligas. And they turn in them into eyewitnesses to frame Stephen Avery. So I'll let you guys go back and watch that. Kisses to everybody. Thanks for bearing with me in my little head cold. I don't even care. I feel fine. I just sound rough. So um, I hope you all have a wonderful day and that we'll get together with all, all fortune. We'll get together on Monday and do part three. Thank you so much. Have a great night or day. <laughs>